Hello, everybody, and welcome to the Winecast. This is a short cast that aims to demystify a technical term that comes up surprisingly often when talking about winemaking, carbonic maceration. You'll hear this term a lot when talking about the wines of Beaujolais in France, on which I'm hoping to do a cast in the near future. It also features as a process in other wine regions, and it's seen as an important part of the toolkit of the natural wine movement. So with all that in mind, let's have a look. We can start with a basic definition. Carbonic maceration is a process that leads to fermentation involving whole clusters of grapes that have intact, uncrushed, or unruptured berries, and that takes place in an anaerobic or oxygen-free environment that's made that way by carbon dioxide gas. The old school name for CO2 was carbonic gas, and that's how the process got its moniker. Unlike a conventional fermentation, this process doesn't involve yeast acting on the sugars in the grapes to produce alcohol, but on a different suite of chemical interactions. It's also done almost exclusively on red grapes rather than white grapes. It can be done on white grapes, but the particular flavors that this process produces in the finished wine usually don't go well with the other characteristics of a white wine as opposed to a red. Finally, carbonic maceration is an old process, and some form of it may go back to the very beginnings of winemaking. This process actually has two major variations. One of them is a true or exclusively carbonic maceration, and the other could be called a semi-carbonic maceration. This may seem counterintuitive, but the semi-carbonic form is actually the older of the two, and the more commonly done, so let's take a look at it first. It's done by starting with a container and filling it with whole clusters of grapes and then putting a lid on it. The weight of the grapes will crush the clusters on the bottom and release grape juice that interacts with ambient yeast and begins a conventional fermentation. One of the byproducts of which is carbon dioxide gas. Since CO2 is heavier and denser than oxygen, as it fills the container, it pushes the oxygen out through an airlock or maybe just through gaps between the lid and the container and creates an anaerobic environment. These steps probably first happened accidentally early in the history of winemaking, when a winemaker left his grapes untended for too long. But now the process is usually done intentionally and can be finessed via technology. It's in this kind of environment that a different type of fermentation called intracellular fermentation takes place. Here's a closer look. Let's start with the red grape. If we peel the skin back, you can see that the pulp of most red grapes is clear colored. And if you crush grapes like this, the juice that runs out will also be clear. What gives red wine its color is extended contact between the released juice and the skin of the grape, a process called maceration. The grape skins contain compounds called polyphenols made up of anthocyanins that are color compounds and also special compounds called tannins that provide the astringent, mouth-drying feel that you get from red wines and that are also important in preserving the wine to help it age. These compounds make their way into the juice through contact with grape skins during maceration. Also at this time, the juice that's been released will come into contact with ambient yeast and begin fermenting, potentially until all the perceptible sugar in the wine has been converted to alcohol by the yeast. What I just described is called a conventional maceration and a conventional fermentation. But for a carbonic maceration, where the polyphenols get into the juice under the influence of carbon dioxide, you need to surround the grape berries with that gas, like we did in our container with the fermenting juice in the bottom, and something different happens to the juice in the unbroken berries. First, the grapes absorb the carbon dioxide and begin an oxygen-free and yeast-free fermentation that breaks down the sugars in the grape to create alcohol, and also lowers the acidity of the grape juice. While this is happening, the anthocyanins and tannins in the skins make their way into the pulp, turning the pulp a pink, purplish color. However, more anthocyanins, the color compounds, make their way in than do tannins, so the resulting juice in the pulp will be brightly colored, but relatively low in tannin when compared to extraction from traditional juice and skin contact. At this time, a number of other reactions take place inside the grape that create unusual flavors in the juice, including particularly bright examples of red fruits like strawberry, raspberry, and cherry, as well as banana and bubblegum. Finally, when the alcohol level in the individual berries reaches a point at about 2.5%, the berries will die and this process will shut down. At this point, the grapes can be pressed and the resulting juice will have properties all its own. It'll be low in tannin, have lots of fresh fruit flavors, and will also have quite a bit of sugar and be very low in alcohol, clocking in at about 2.25% alcohol by volume.
The juice will have to undergo a second yeast-driven conventional fermentation to bring it up to the alcohol level in a standard wine. Because there will be no further skin contact between the juice and the grapes during this fermentation, the resulting wine will still be low in tannin and will preserve a lot of the bright fruit and other aromas that were the result of intracellular fermentation. How fruity, uniquely aromatized, and low in tannin the final wine will be depends on the proportion of whole clusters in the mix to the amount of juice that fermented and macerated conventionally. So this process is called a semi-carbonic maceration because only part of the phenols are extracted under the influence of CO2 and another part is extracted during the conventional fermentation at the bottom of the container when the juice is in direct contact with the skins of the crushed grapes. Where do you find this style of winemaking? As I mentioned in the introduction, Beaujolais in southeastern France is probably the region most famously associated with it. And while it plays a part in every quality level of wine there, the bright fruit and bubblegum aromas are a hallmark of the Beaujolais Nouveau style. Though it's less well known than Beaujolais for this style, Rioja in Spain has a tradition of using this process, especially in the Alavesa sub-region to the north of Rioja, and especially for producing young, unoaked wines designated as Joven. At the basic Bourgogne AOC level in Burgundy, you'll find some wines that went through a semi-carbonic maceration, but with only a small portion of the grapes left whole, leaving the finished wine with some of the bright fruit flavors and aromas you'd expect, but still dominated by the characteristics of more conventionally made wines. But the style occurs throughout the wine world, sometimes unintentionally. All it takes is for a winemaker to let his grapes sit too long in a covered bin, and the wine made from those grapes may show some carbonic characteristics, whether that was the intention or not. So what's the draw of this process? Well, it does produce wines in a unique style. Fresh, fruit-forward, easy, and frankly fun to drink. And like they do in some parts of Beaujolais, Rioja, and Burgundy, winemakers can produce very sophisticated wines that have elements of this style by controlling the proportion of the grapes that remain whole and go through carbonic maceration. But there's an economic angle too, because winemakers using this process aren't looking for big, tannic, bold fruit flavors from wine made this way. They don't need long periods of skin and juice contact, and the fresh flavors of these wines don't usually benefit from extended aging either before or after release. So these wines can be made and released quickly, sometimes within just six weeks of harvest like Beaujolais Nouveau typically are. All of this can make semi-carbonic wines into serious money makers for their respective wineries, helping to ensure some cash flow while the other wines in the portfolio mature. So if that's semi-carbonic maceration, what would a true carbonic maceration be? As with semi-carbonic, you start with a container. And then you fill that container with CO2, which will flush all of the oxygen out of it. Then you can add whole clusters of grapes carefully to the container, to avoid crushing any of the grapes and releasing any of the juice. The container can then be sealed and ideally all of the grapes will undergo intracellular fermentation. After intracellular fermentation is complete, the grapes can be pressed and the juice can undergo conventional fermentation as it would after a semi-carbonic maceration. A true carbonic maceration produces very lightly colored wines with few tannins because none of the juice has had conventional contact with grape skins, but the carbonic flavors and aromas from this process are even more pronounced than in a semi-carbonic treatment. This process is of relatively recent vintage and was pioneered by a winemaker and natural wine proponent named Jules Chauvet from Beaujolais. Because a true carbonic maceration keeps the grapes away from oxygen, winemakers identified with the natural wine movement have found it to be a valuable tool because it eliminates the need to add sulfur to the grapes prior to fermentation to prevent microbial growth and to reduce oxidation. Thanks for joining me for another winecast. I hope this cleared up the complicated issue of carbonic and semi-carbonic maceration, but I also hope it raised some questions too. If it did, please let me know in the comments or just feel free to leave any comment at all. Please like and subscribe if you haven't already, and I'm always looking for suggestions for future casts, so please leave those in the comments as well. I'm your host, The Unknown Winecaster, and I'm out. Enjoy the grape, but always enjoy it responsibly.